So now let me introduce the first of our speakers. Um, and we're honored to have, as our first speaker, Prof Professor Kenneth Kemp. Uh, Kenneth W. Kemp is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He received an MA in the History and Philosophy of Science and a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. Much of his recent research has been centered on the relation of science and religion. His book, The War That Never Was, Evolution and Christian Theology, was published by Cascade um, last year, I guess, last year. It is a terrific book, uh, which I was happy and honored to be able to review for the journal First Things. He is currently writing a history of Catholic evolutionism. Uh, Professor Kemp is a scholar associate of the Society of Catholic Scientists. Um, his talk is entitled, The Catholic Reception of Evolutionary Biology, an Overview. Uh, talk, I'll present an account of the place of evolutionism in Catholic intellectual history over the course of the last two centuries. That history shows controversy, not at least until sometime after 1950, consensus. There were, to be sure, reasons for the evolution skepticism that Catholic evolutionists once faced. First, one must acknowledge the counterintuitive character of evolutionary biology, feature that it has in common with such other scientific ideas as the motion of the Earth and the atomic structure of matter, not to mention quantum mechanics. Second, one must acknowledge the extent to which evolutionary theory became, through no particular fault of its own, associated with some of the 19th century's genuinely bad ideas, exemplified by the materialist philosophy of nature of Ernst Haeckel and the Bible skepticism of the essays and reviews. I acknowledge the seriousness of the concerns of the Catholic evolutionists of the past. Those concerns were, however, well answered by the scientists and theologians whose work I'm about to review. What was once understandable caution about new ideas can now be a cause of, uh, of scandal. So, to begin, what do I mean by the term Catholic evolutionism? I did not mean uh, by evolutionism, a unified picture of the world based on some single cosmical process, one and continuous from nebula to man, from star to soul, from atom to society. That's a quotation from, from somebody else, but it doesn't matter whom. Uh, such pictures have been proposed in a materialistic way by German biologist Ernst Haeckel, by English philosopher Herbert Spencer in the 19th century, and in a spiritualistic way by French Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Théard de Chardin in the 20th. In developing those worldviews, however, Haeckel, Spencer, and Théard went far beyond drawing conclusions from scientific evidence. One can construct an evolutionary picture of the world along more purely scientific and less uh, unified lines by synthesizing a number of different distinct ideas. Uh, the Big Bang theory, a somewhat Laplacean theory of the origin of the solar system, somewhat Laelian geology, an as yet undeveloped account of the origin of life, and a somewhat Darwinian account of the origin of species. Although, the although these theories have sometimes been accused of being attacks on Christianity, that idea is an error, both historically and logically. Whatever the uses to which these theories might have been put by some, but by no means all of their supporters, they were not essentially attacks on Christian doctrine. Indeed, their foundations were laid partly by Catholics, René Descartes, Blessed Neil Stenson, Father George Lemaitre, partly by other Christians, Charles Lyell, and partly by men who had lost their Christian faith for reasons unconnected to evolution, but who did not make any Christian polemics a feature of their works, Charles Darwin. The topic of this talk will be the Catholic reception of just one part of that synthesis, the part which explains the origin of biological species, including the question of whether that theory also explains the origin of the human race. How have Catholics attempted to reconcile that part with theological doctrine? What's been the reaction of the official church? I'll answer that question in three parts. But before beginning, I want to be mention one more thing. I said that the synthesis that makes sense to me lacks the kind of unity 
of the Weltan Chongen of Heckel and Tayar. It will, however, uh, at least for have at least for Catholics, an underlying idea, a theology of nature that guides its particular components, and that is thus useful to bear in mind as we proceed. Belgian priest geologist and what I call third generation Catholic evolutionist Henri de, de Darlado called it Christian naturalism and characterized it as the tendency to attribute to the natural action of secondary causes all that is not excluded therefrom, either by reason or to the positive data of the natural sciences, and to have recourse to a special divine intervention distinct from God's general governing activity only if it's absolutely necessary to do so. So that's the Darlado, now me. The idea was not, of course, new with him. It has been expressed already, it had been expressed already by Jesuit entomologist Eric Vossmann at the beginning of the 20th century. Its roots in St. Augustine and St. Thomas will, I think, be the topic of later presentations. <clears throat> so, first uh, of the three parts on creation, the hexameron, that is the six days of Genesis, and uh, evolutionary origin of plants and animals. <clears throat> it is, to be sure, popular. Uh, to contrast the ideas of creation and evolution as though they were contrary ideas. <clears throat> They're not. The doctrine of creation is a metaphysical thesis asserting that God brought in the world into being out of nothing, the world depending on God for its very existence. Alternatives to that doctrine are, uh, would include Aristotle's eternalism, Plotinus' emanationism, Manichaean dualism, the peculiarly modern idea of a spontaneous exnihilation. Uh, the doctrine of creation is neutral with regard to whether the world, once created, undergoes evolutionary changes over the course of its existence. But the, the existence of those alternatives shows at the same time that it does real work. Evolutionary biology is an instance of what I call a paleoetiological theory, one that explains the present state of the world by reference to ancient causes. Georges Lemaitre, Belgian priest cosmologist and one of the inventors of the Big Bang Theory, characterized theories of this type as proposing to seek out initial conditions which are ideally simple, from which the present world in all its complexity might have resulted through the natural interplay of known forces. Such theories, I say, you would have said, presuppose the existence of the world. They do not explain it. So no one should be surprised to read from Theodosius Stobzhansky, one of the 20th century's leading evolutionary biologists, that it's wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive alternatives. I am a creationist and an evolutionist. Not only are they not contradictory, they're not even answers to the same question. Darwin's theory of evolution begins with the idea of the transformability of species, as of the two major pre-Darwinian evolutionary theories, uh, those of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in his uh, zoological philosophy and of Robert Chambers in his Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, so published in 1809 and 1844. That idea emerged in part in order to explain a paleontological fact the, the fact that, or the fact, was first recognized in the first years of the 19th century by English surveyor and canal builder William Smith. Smith noticed, as he dug his canals, that different strata of the earth had distinct fossil content. Those strata had long been recognized as corresponding to succeeding epochs in the, histor in the history of the earth, an idea that had been proposed by Blessed Neil Stenson, the 17th century Danish anatomist, geologist, and bishop, who had included it, who had included it in his uh, prodromos, or forerunner, to a dissertation on a solid naturally contained within a solid, published in 1669. His principle, the principle of sup superposition, said that at the time when, the, uh, when an upper stratum was formed, the lower stratum had already become solid, at the time when the lowest stratum was being formed, none of the upper strata existed. The obvious conclusion from what Smith observed was that at successive periods in the history of the planet, the Earth was inhabited by successive species of living things. That idea is not part of or an inference from any evolutionary theory. Indeed, it was accepted in the early 19th century by the leading French geologist, the anti-evolutionist Georges Cuvier, 
who had noticed the same thing in the Paris Basin, no less than by Smith, who advanced no theory at all about the cause of the succession. What explains this faunal succession? What's the origin of the species which occur in higher geological strata but are not found in the lower strata? Species that, is, that existed in later periods of the Earth's history but to all appearances not in earlier ones. Cuvier appealed to successive catastrophic extinctions followed by new creations. This brings us to Jean-Baptiste de Malou d'Alois, died in 1875, the first of three scientists whom I'll call the pioneers of Catholic evolutionism. He was first and foremost a geologist, but the paleontological aspects of that larger science led him to consider the question of the origin of species. One can distinguish two steps in his, thought, in his thoughts about that question. His first negative idea came as early as 1811, or sorry, 1812 to, to 13, when he rejected the explanation proposed by Cuvier, who, as it happens, had been one of his professors at the Sorbonne. Such phenomena, he argued, were inconsistent with the details of the paleontological record and more generally with the way nature ordinarily works. He also thought it to be theologically problematic. Oh, there. Uh, I uh, find it hard to believe that the omnipotent being which I consider to be the author of nature, has at different epochs caused all living beings to perish in order to give himself the pleasure of creating new beings, which on the basis of, uh, of the same general plans present success, sorry, let me read, he'll do better, uh, present successive differences tending to strive at the present forms and sometimes reproducing the rudiments of organs that were useful to earlier beings but which have no use to the later ones. It seems to me, he went on, much more probable and more in conformity with the eminent wisdom of the Creator to admit that, just as he had given living beings the power of reproduction, so he has also endowed them with the property of modifying themselves according to circumstances, a phenomenon of which nature still gives examples. His second positive idea, his second and positive idea, was his defense of transformism as a better account of what he called the succession of living things than was another proposed explanation, partial extinction followed by migration. Such migration does sometimes actually occur, but would leave as singular coincidences such facts as the similarity between living and extinct animals in the same region, similarities among organisms geographically adjacent to one another, and the generally progressive succession found in the geological column. And so one is left with transformism. Is this inconsistent with the apparent stability of species over the course of generations? De you thought it was not. However great the stability of species is, it's not absolute. And if we look at the history of now existing living things in this regard, we'll see that various causes can lead to change in their forms. The fact that modern species are the products of evolution does not in the least affect their status as the products of creation, a point made nicely by a second of the three pioneers who constituted the first generation of Catholic evolutionists. So, there he is, St. George Jackson Miver. He's not a saint. His parents gave him that name at the baptismal font. So. But uh, anyway, he was, died in 1900. He was an English anatomist and systematic zoologist who, at the age of 17, gave up his dreams of an Oxford education in order to enter the Catholic Church. Fortunately, he was nevertheless able to get elsewhere, as it happens from Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, the education necessary to pursue scientific research. Mivert's On the Genesis of Species, published in 1871, was the first book-length Catholic comment on Darwin's work. What I want to note here is his distinction between absolute and derivative creation. In the strictest and highest sense, creation is the absolute origination of anything by God, without pre-existing means or material, and is a supernatural act. In the second and lower sense, creation is a formation of anything by God derivatively, that is, uh, that the preceding matter had been created with a potentiality to evolve from it under suitable conditions, all the various forms it subsequently assumed. That distinction, he argued, is sufficient to erase the alleged contradiction between the theory of evolution and the doctrine of creation. The conflict has arisen, he wrote, through a misunderstanding. 
Some have supposed that by creation was necessarily meant either primary, that is absolute creation, or at least some supernatural action. They have therefore opposed the dogma of creation to the imagined interest of physical science. Others have supposed that by evolution was necessarily meant a denial of divine action and negation of the providence of God. They have therefore combated the theory of evolution in the imagined interest of religion. Is this consistent with Hexameron? <clears throat> Although many of the fathers and many, of the the and many theologians since then have read the first chapter of the book of Genesis as saying that God created at least some species of animals directly, not all read it that way. Two who did not were St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine, who figure prominently in the theological defense of Catholic evolutionism. Neither, of course, discussed precisely transformist accounts of zoogenesis, what they did was put by second generation Catholic evolutionist John Zahm as, as follows. I'll just read one because we have a talk coming up on Augustine, but uh, focus on St. Gregory. God created matter in a formless or nebulous condition, but impressed on this matter the power of developing into all the various forms which it afterwards assumed. The fact that Darwin's theory quickly became entangled with the anti-Christian philosophical views of some of its opponents not Darwin himself, but his English colleague Huxley, his French translator Clemence Roy, and his leading German promoters Karl Vogt and Ernst Haeckel, surely contributed to the excessive suspicion with which his own biological views were met by many Catholics. The fact that Catholicism was also in the 19th century under assault from other aspects of 19th century culture the residue of the penal laws in England, anti-clerical republicanism in France, the Kulturkampf in Germany, the Risorgimento in Italy, only further complicated the Catholic reception of these new ideas. To take just one example, uh, and I'm going to quote from historian Harry Paul here, in France, there was a clear attempt to base anti-clerical republican politics on a scientistic ideology. Darwin was most susceptible to exploitation by anti-clericals, the intellectual problem of reconciling religious beliefs with new scientific developments was thus connected with the Republican anti-clericalism. This meant that Republicans were encouraged to accept Darwinism and that Catholics had a good political reason to be suspicious of it as an ideological weapon against Catholicism. Only the finest minds were capable of separating the purely scientific aspects of Darwinism from the wider social and political implications. So that's that's uh, Harry Paul, now me again. Nevertheless, despite the scientific reservations about evolutionary zoogenesis that their authors sometimes had, the articles in late 19th century Catholic encyclopedias show a fairly quick acceptance of what might be called at least compatibilism on this question. So here, two examples. Oh, no, there was. I'll uh, just read the, the, the second one. Pierre Julien Amar wrote in the, in the Apologetic Dictionary of the, of the Catholic Faith, published in, in 1889. The Bible grants equal freedom to transform us and to the defenders of successive creations. Whenever it's not absolutely explicit, anyone who invokes its authority puts at risk both the Bible itself and the religious cause of which it is the support. It would be superfluous and irrelevant to say any more about a question which concerns uh, religious... Uh, concerns only, only indirectly. The teaching of evolution is in no way incompatible with Christian dogma. What aggravates the debate is the making of what is in itself a purely scientific question into a question of orthodoxy, as if the evolutionist principle were absolutely irreconcilable and, in, and incompatible with religious faith. That compatibilism, which you can find also in the uh, other source I, I, I mentioned there, was extended to two other Darwinian theses, common ancestry and natural selection, despite some preference for processes that seem more teleological than to natural selection and a theories of ancestry that were not completely monophyletic. Natural selection in particular was scientifically controversial until the forging of the synthesis of Darwinism and Mendelism in the 1930s, but it had its Catholic defenders as well as its Catholic critics. So, that about evolutionary origin of plants and animals. Uh, what about human beings? So my second point is going to focus on human exceptionalism and evolutionary anthropogenesis. 
It was, of course, impossible to propose the evolutionary origin of plant and animal species without raising the question of whether the same theory did not also apply to man. Although evolutionary, the evolutionary origin of plants and animals was, as I said above, generally accepted as theologically unproblematic by Catholics, the human exceptionalism that is a central tenet of Catholic anthropology made the question of evolutionary anthropogenesis different. The Catholic account of that exceptionalism had two aspects. Man differs from animals in kind behaviorally, that's point one, that is they have, and animals lack the capacity for rational thought and free choice. Man also differs in having a spiritual and immortal soul. Catholic theology connects those two aspects. The spiritual soul is what makes rational thought possible, but the details of that connection need not concern us here. The two major early 19th century, that is pre-Darwinian evolutionists, Lamarck and Chambers, had both applied their evolutionary theories to man. Darwin, for the most part, avoided the question of man's origin when he published On the Origin of Species in 1859, but Huxley, Vogt, and, and, and Giovanni Castrini all made the application in the 1960s. In 1871, the descent, in the descent of man, Darwin did so as well. It's important to note that Darwin's descent of man was not a mere application of the ideas expressed in the origin. To effect that application, he needed an argument against human exceptionalism. Darwin generally avoided theological and metaphysical issues and had nothing to say about the human soul. He focused rather on the other aspect of exceptionalism, arguing that the similarities between man and animal are not merely physiological but extended to mentality as well. All human mental powers, not only perception and emotion, but conceptual thought uh, were, at best, better developed versions of powers found, at least in incipient forms, in animals as well. Man not being different in kind from other animals, Darwin thought there was no reason to think that, the man, that man was different in origin. That origin, then, is to be found in descent with modification by natural selection from pre-human animals. How do Catholics reply to the idea of evolutionary anthropogenesis? Although two works of 18th century materialism, both incidentally evolutionists, Benoit de Maillet's Teleomed, uh, published in 1748, and Erasmus Darwin's Zoonomia, uh, published in the 1790s, had been placed on the index of prohibited books uh, in 1771 and 1817, respectively. The first official statement about the new evolutionary accounts of human origins, however, came in 1860. From uh, the provincial council convened by Johannes Cardinal von Geisel, Archbishop of Cologne, in order to address a wide range of points of doctrine ranging from the Trinity to creation in man. It was, I believe, in response to Chambers in particular that the council uh, taught that uh, our first parents were made immediately by God. Therefore, clearly opposed to sacred scripture and to faith is the opinion that man ever, even considering only his body, was brought forth by the spontaneous change of a less perfect nature into a more perfect one in a way that is continuous and culminates in a human nature. Although the statement has been cited by Catholic evolutionists for a century and a half now, it has neither the reach nor the authority which is sometimes attributed to it. The question of its substantive reach turns on two points. <clears throat> the first is this. What's meant by spontaneous change? Second generation Catholic evolutionist, French Dominican Delma uh, Leroy, who died in 1905, suggested that the point of the word spontaneous is to reject precisely atheistic or even non-providentialist theories. That seems to me to be correct. All versions of Catholic evolutionism have, of course, been providentialist. Second. While its condemnation of the idea that continuous changes in animal bodies could culminate in human nature, while that does tell against Chambers and against Darwin, it does not do so against the exceptionalist accounts that were soon to be offered by Catholic evolutionists. In any case, the provincial council does not have universal jurisdiction for what it's worth, although the fathers and the uh, parity, the experts at the Vatican Council held 10 years later, were aware of the decrees of the Council of Cologne, the working papers of the Ecumenical Council show no intention of addressing the origin of the human body in the Ecumenical Council's own uh, statement about human origins. Those were, were drafts which were in any case uh, 
not brought to the fathers as a whole, the council being aborted uh, before it finished its work. We can see the exceptionalism that distinguished Catholic evolutionism from Darwin's account, uh, which distinguished Catholic evolutionism from Darwin's account of anthropogenesis in the work of two of the Catholic pioneers of first generation Catholic evolutionism. Let's begin with a defense of a behavioral exceptionalism. Filippo de Filippi, who died in 1867, was one of the leading Italian naturalists of his day and a sincere and practicing Catholic. Professor of Zoology and Director of the Zoological Museum at the University of Turin, he also found time for both popular science writing and for reflection on the relationship between science and religion. His 1864 lecture on Man and the Apes did much to launch the debate over Darwinism in Italy. De Filippi was sympathetic to some of the ideas Darwin had expressed in the origin, not only to the transformation of species, but to natural selection as well. He offered, however, a particularly explicit account of human exceptionalism. Let's begin with this point that to say that man is descended from an ape is to do more than to express an anatomical fact. It is perhaps too easy to read his statement with an emphasis on the word fact, that's an anatomical fact. It would express his large view equally well, perhaps better, if the emphasis were placed on the word anatomical. It's an anatomical fact. De Filippi's second point, and in his view, the one even more important than the first, was that there is more to man than anatomy. The correspondences between man and ape with respect to structure are of less significance than the differences at the level of instinct and, and, uh, and intellect. Here's what he said. The more we reduce the physical inequalities uh, between man and ape, the more the inequalities remain. The differences in powers grow in importance. The place of man in nature must be determined not by the more, not by the more or less of morphological characteristics subject to variation within the narrow confines of a species, but by the comparison of the powers proper to man with, uh, with those of animals. Let's turn next to the structural exceptionalism in the work of, of, uh, of Mivert. His account of anthropogenesis was most explicitly presented in his On the Genesis of Species. Its key idea is the evolution of a suitable body followed by the infusion of a created soul. Scripture, he wrote, says that God made man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is a plain and direct statement. The man's body was evolved from pre-existing material, symbolized by the term dust of the earth, and was therefore formed by the operation of secondary laws. The soul of every individual man, he added, is created, that is produced by a direct or supernatural act, and of course, by such an act, the soul of the first man was similarly created. That is true of every human being, so of course it's true of the first. Mivert's view about the human body was, of course, controversial, but not so much so as to prevent Henry Cardinal Manning from recommending that Mivert receive an honorary degree from the Vatican as someone distinguished for his public refutation of unbelievers who misused the physical sciences. That recommendation was accepted by Pope Pius IX, and the degree was awarded in 1876. Still, <clears throat> many Catholic theologians thought that Mivert's view was rash, or even the scripture and the writings of the church fathers made a, a contrary account, namely that God formed the first human body directly out of dust, or at least out of non-living matter, that made that all contrary account theologically certain. Mivert's genesis of species was never subject to official censure, but in the 1890s, in the second generation of Catholic evolutionism, two other broadly Mivertist books, uh, Leroy's The Evolution Restricted to Organic Species, published in 1891, and American Holy Cross Priest John Zom's Evolution and Dogma, published in 1896. Those two books were denounced to the Congregation of the Index of Prohibited Books, which, without putting the books on the index itself, instructed the authors to withdraw the books from circulation and to make a public retraction of their account of the origin of the first human body. The Jesuit Curia was similarly insistent that Jesuit entomologist Eric Vossmann uh, not suggest that the question was open in his uh, Modern Biology and the Theory of Evolution, published in uh, 1904 and 1906. <clears throat> These were ad hoc decisions. 
The church issued no public teaching on the question, neither on the truth of the matter nor on whether it was rash to suggest it. In 1898, some of the consultors at the index suggested that the Holy Office publish a statement on the matter, but the Holy Office did not do so. A second Catholic account of anthropogenesis emerged some 20 years after the appearance of Mimbert's book, uh, Theferino Catholis, died in 1894, was a Dominican priest, a bishop, then a cardinal, whose final appointment was, clerical appointment, was as Archbishop of Toledo, the primatial see of Spain. He had done scholarly work throughout his career, making a significant contribution to the Thomistic revival in the Hispanophone world. In 1889, he resigned his pastoral responsibilities and devoted the last five years of his life to a scholarship, and particularly to a two-volume work on the Bible and science, published 1891, in which he addressed, among other topics, the question of anthropogenesis. Gonzalez did not think that Mivert's views could be said to be contrary to Catholic doctrine. Nevertheless, he thought they had grave drawbacks, philosophical, scientific, and exegetical. He proposed consideration of an alternative. Oh, look at, behind, there he is. Uh, he said, juxtaposition of Mivert's hypothesis with a possibility noted by St. Thomas, regarding the possibility that causes or agents other than God intervened in the formation of Adam's body, that is to say, in its preliminary preparation up to an imperfect stage of development, reserving the final stages of its preparation to receive a rational soul to divine action. In this way, the essence of Mirror's hypothesis is preserved with due regard to the direct and immediate action of God in the formation of the body of the first man action which traditional biblical exegesis seems to require. Although Gonzalez never endorsed the alternative which he had articulated, it did find a defense a few years later in the work of another Spanish-Dominican, Juan Arintero, in the Evolution and Christian Philosophy, published in 1898. Tom, a memorist, argued against this view. He said, if we're to admit that evolution had anything whatever to do with man's corporeal frame, it seems more logical to admit that it finished uh, at the work which it began. More logical to, to admit that than to suppose that God gave to his secondary agents a work which they might commence, indeed, but which, by reason of limitations imposed on them, they were unable to complete. But Psalms unable seems to miss the point of Gonzalez's theological concerns. One might also point out that there seems to be no practical possibility of a conflict between Gonzalez Arantero's account of the, uh, and any possible results of scientific research. In 1908, Arantero was denounced to the Holy Office by two zealous anti-modernists. The Holy Office decision to reject the denunciation was approved by, by Pope Pius X. Uh, and just to be explicit, the uh, review of his works did include the reading of what he had to say about evolution. The question of the origin of our first parents was, uh, was addressed in a more public official way by the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1909 as part of its answer to the eight, to eight questions on the historical character of the first three chapters of Genesis. It said, the literal historical sense may not be called into doubt in the cases of the distinctive creation of man and the formation of the first woman from the first man or the unity of the human race. There are other things on the list. I just put here what's relevant. Some have seen in these statements an official rejection of the evolutionary origin of the first human body. But this does not seem to be correct. The archives of the commission have unfortunately been lost. But that the decree did not constitute such a rejection is clear from some informal remarks which Laurent Janssen, its secretary, and in that capacity also the signatory of that decree, uh, some remarks that he made, made later that year. Janssen was asked by uh, Monsignor Jules de Becker, uh, rector of the uh, American College of Louvain, he was asked, is it true that the Biblical Commission had the intention to condemn application of the transformist theory to the origin of the body of the first man? Not at all, replied Monsignor Janssen. Quite the contrary. It avoided doing that. It's true that certain cardinals were not exactly proponents of the theory, but we chose the wording precisely so as not to touch on that question and in order not to exclude the, the theory. 
Catholic evolutionists began losing ground, that is, the anti-evolutionists began losing ground in the offices of the church during the pontificate of uh, Pope Pius XI in what might be called the third generation of Catholic evolutionism. As two cases at the index uh, make clear, the first of those cases began in 1923 when Willem Cardinal von Rossum, president of the, of the Biblical Commission, denounced Henri de Dorlado's uh, Darwinism in Catholic thought, originally published in 1918, to the index. De Dorlado had not explicitly defended evolutionary anthropogenesis in that book, but he had promised to do so. Uh, in a, he promised to do so in a second book, in terms sufficiently clear to irritate direct formationists. In the end, the index recommended that the book be withdrawn from circulation and that de Darlado should not publish the second volume without consulting the Holy Father. Rather than approving the recommendation, Pius XI instructed the Holy Office to ask the opinion of Désiré Cardinal Mercier in, in Belgium. In the end, no action was taken against the book, but de Darlado agreed not to publish his planned second volume. Many of de Dorlado's ideas about anthropogenesis did make their way into print a decade later, however, in a work published by his former student, English priest Ernest Messenger, in a book called Evolution and Theology, published in 1931. Unlike Mirren and Wassman, uh, Messenger devoted little attention to scientific aspects of his subject. His book is the most thoroughly theological of any of the major works of Catholic evolutionism. His conclusions about the origin of the human body were broadly compatibilist, without being fully evolutionist. They are, in a certain sense, negative. From the scientific point of view, there is no, there is so far no conclusive evidence that man had evolved, has evolved, but as an inference, it's very attractive. I think I didn't put that. Oh, no, there it is, okay. Um, from the theological point of view, scripture neither teaches nor disproves the doctrine of the evolution of the human body. So his uh, views are also cautious. Messenger organized his summary of the book around the interrogatory triad. Could God have used evolutionary processes in the formation of the first human body? He could have done so. Would it have been fitting for him to have done so? It would have been fitting. Did he in fact do so? Messenger's final verdict on the whole question, indeed the very last words of the book after his answering the first two questions in the affirmative, is we... We think on the whole, it on the whole preferable for a Catholic to suspend his judgment on the matter at the present time, or at least not to give any unqualified assent to the evolutionary hypothesis. And so we end on a note of interrogation. Fake it? Did you do it? On the 19th of January, 1933, Gaetano Cardinal Bisletti, president of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, deleted Messenger's book to the Holy Office for deviating substantially from the Catholic tradition in the matter of the creation of the human body, giving a large role to the theory of evolution. The consultants who reviewed the book generally thought that at least the book should not be reprinted. All thought, however, that an internal study of evolutionism in the light of the most recent historical, physical, physiological, astronomical, and especially geological discoveries would be in order. Most of the cardinals at the subsequent general congregation thought that the book should be withdrawn from sale. Two, however, recommended that no action be taken. At the papal audience the next day, Pope Pius XI accepted the recommendation of the two and requested that the Holy Office get from Wilhelm Schmidt, uh, uh, a priest with whom he'd worked earlier, an authoritative account of the scientific data of anthropological paleontology. Schmidt was asked to prepare a study of the question or to suggest to the Holy Office someone else who could. The records of the Holy Office summarized his report as, as follows. Father Schmidt concluded that according to the current state of science in the matter of the origins of matter from a lower species of animal, the evolutionary hypothesis for the origin of the human soul must be ruled out, but that it cannot be absolutely ruled out in the case of the human body. On that point, science is uncertain and subject to continuous revision. It would therefore be best to continue waiting. Now, what's particularly important to note here is that he was asked precisely for a scientific answer to the status question, the question. He said, they only asked him, what does science say about, about uh, this? That was what the Pope wanted uh, 
to hear about in more detail. On the 22nd of June, 1938, the General Congregation recommended that the matter be set aside. At the audience on the following day, Pope Pius asked to see Schmidt's report before making his decision. In the end, no action was taken against Messenger's book. The issue was addressed in a public way for the first time by Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Humanity Generis in 1950, where he wrote that the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussion on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution, in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. The Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. My research on the encyclical, uh, the archival record of which was opened only in March of last year, were interrupted by the closure of Rome with the outbreak of the COVID epidemic. But in the short time I had to review the relevant documents, I saw no indication that inclusion of this point in the encyclical was uh, controversial. Was it not something at least new? Arguably not. On the 2nd of January 1950, as a papal commission was preparing the encyclical, uh, Carlo Brivio, a priest of the Pontifical Institute for Foreign Missions, an entomologist, and a student of theology at the Gregorian University, submitted a dissertation entitled The Origin of the Human Body According to the Doctrine of the Principal post tridentine Theologians. The discussion itself, as the title suggests, is fundamentally historical, but the author, of course, recognized the relevance of his work to issues under discussion in his own day. Brevio summarized a post tridentine thought by saying it does not seem to be opposed either to the possibility of a successive formation of Adam's body or to what, or what is more important, to the possibility of a partial cooperation by created causes. There were even theologians positively open both to successive formation and to angelic cooperation. Although the secondary causes under consideration by the theologians who were the subject of Brevio's study were angels, Brevio thought that it was clear that their arguments could be extended to secondary causes that were not only created but, but natural. Can we and must we, he wrote, in light of the statements of the assertion uh, common to all the theologians, exclude all forms of evolutionism? We think not. It's not possible to draw from the doctrines of that period any truly theological argument against the possibility of the cooperation of secondary causes in the formation of man. St. John Paul II in his general audience of the 16th April of April 1986 said that from the, view, from the viewpoint of the doctrine of the faith, there are no difficulties in explaining the origin of man in regard to the body by means of the theory of evolution. So, my final point. Uh, the original sin in, in monogenesis. Humanity generous at the same time that it explicitly acknowledged theological openness to the evolutionary origin of the first human body, expressed theological reservations about a second feature of standard evolutionary accounts of anthropogenesis. That account was a question of whether, or that rather, was the question of whether the human race originated in a single human couple or in multiple human couples, possibly even multiple distinct human populations. Catholic theology had a traditionally asserted a monogenetic origin of the human species because of the close connection of that idea with the doctrine of original sin. The Council of Trent had taught a three-point doctrine. Original sin is one in its origin, second, transfused into all by propagation, not by imitation, and third, in all men and proper to each. Without a single first sinner who was the ancestor to all other human beings, such an original sin would be impossible. Nevertheless, an alternative polygynist account of human origins claiming that different ethnic groups or races had distinct origins has from time to time made its appearance, for example, in the work of Isaac La Perrier in the 17th century and Louis Agassiz in the 19th. Darwin, though not all Darwinists, defended a view intermediate between those alternatives. His theory implied a single center of creation for every species. He wrote, all the individuals of the same species, wherever located at present, have descended from the same parents. 
By parents, however, he meant an entire initial population, not just a single first couple. Heckel said that the idea of there being a first human being was as strange as would be the idea that there was a first Englishman. Catholic terminology now usually distinguishes Darwin's idea as a monophyletic polygenism opposed to the polyphyletic polygenism of uh, La Pereira and Agassiz. This view was reinforced in the case of human origins by developments in genetics. One scientists were able to compa compare, a distinct, compare distinct alleles across species. They noticed that the diversity found at certain loci in the human genome corresponded to a similar diversity found in chimpanzees. The variation, they said, must have originated before these lineages split and was too great to have passed through a phylogenetic bottleneck as narrow as a single couple. Pope Pius XII felt it necessary to address this issue in Humani Generis, where he said that the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed in this, on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him, as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents his first member of, uh, or a certain num number of first parents. It's in no way apparent, he went on to say, how such an opinion can be reconciled with original sin. Some theologians emphasize the seemingly provisional character of that phrase. So in 1955, the Holy Office proposed to Pope Pius that it be allowed to issue a statement in the form of dubium and responsum that would eliminate the ambiguity inherent in the language of the encyclical. The Pope declined to do so, saying that the formulation of which... Uh, that the formulation was deliberately cautious and it's good for it to remain as it is. Some Catholic theologians thought that monophyletism would not be enough to secure, or sorry, would be enough, that monophyletism would be enough to secure a doctrine of original sin. Perhaps original sin did not affect everyone right away. Perhaps it was a sin of the entire first tribe committed together. Perhaps what's important is not the original sin at all, but the fact of universal human sinfulness. I think these alternatives are theologically problematic and scientifically unnecessary. Uh, about, so about 10 years ago, building on the work of Josephite priest Andrew Alexander, I proposed a way of reconciling the scientific claims with the traditional understanding of original sin. An old scholastic adage says, when faced with a contradiction, make a distinction. The distinction I propose uh, distinguishes different senses of the term human species. One's biological, uh, relying on a standard biological definition of the concept, an entire population of interbreeding individuals. These might be called merely biological human beings. The reproductive capacity for suffi sufficient for membership in that population would not, however, itself make biologically human being a rational animal. So the second sense of the term uh, extends it to, uh, a little bit to having the capacity for conceptual thought, judgment, reasoning, free choice. These are philosophically, that is, fully human beings. Rational activity requires the presence of a rational soul, which can only come into being through a creative act of God. The additional concept, there's a second, the uh, additional concept of friendship with God and an eternal destiny could give us a conceptually distinct third sense, theologically human beings. That distinction makes possible an origin of the human race that's polygenetic with respect to the biological species and monogenetic with respect to the philosophical theological species. To show that it's possible, all I need to do is tell a consistent story. So here it is. Suppose this. Evolutionary processes produce a population of about 15,000 hominids, beings that were biologically human because of the reproductive capacities, the compatible with ours, but which lack the capacity for intellectual thought, and they're therefore not fully human. Out of this population, God selected two for whom he created and into which he infused rational souls, thereby transforming them into fully human beings. These first two fully human beings misused their free will by choosing to commit a, the original sin. Some of those fully human beings had offspring by the non-intellectual but still biologically human beings among whom they lived, God endowed the individuals that had even a single fully human ancestor with a rational soul, assuming a reasonable rate of reproductive success and a reasonable selective advantage. Within a few centuries, 
each uh, individual in the entire hominid population would include the first fully human beings among their individual ancestors. The entire population would be fully human. So something like, like that, but those are rough calculations. Through all this process, all fully human beings would be descended from a single original human couple. So just go back to that in case you want to review it. Uh, in the sense of having the first fully human couple among their ancestors, without there ever having been a population bottleneck of two individuals that constitute the higher, entire biologically human species. This scenario accommodates both the genetic evidence and theological doctrine of monogenesis because it does two things. First, it distinguishes between fully, that is, rational human beings, and their biologically human but non-rational relatives, Second, it recognizes that the theological doctrine of monogenesis requires only that all human beings have the original couple among their ancestors, not that they be descended exclusively from this single original couple. They and we can also have even the rather large number of hominid ancestors, which way Ayala says that the gen genetic evidence requires. This theory is monogenetic with respect to fully human beings, but polygenetic with respect to the biological species. Thus, the distinction resolves the contradiction. So, to conclude quickly, the Catholic Church has never taught that the uh, biological theory of evolution is false, applied with care to distinguish its purely scientific content from associated extra scientific ideas. It can contribute to our understanding of the origin of the human race. Catholic scientists and theologians have had a long and successful run in developing a Catholic evolutionism whose components are a Christian naturalism and exceptionalist anthropology and a synthesis of evolution and creation. The product, I think, of a larger epistemological synthesis of faith and, and, uh, and reason. So, thank you for your attention.